It is an extraordinary honor and a great pleasure to speak to you at this fifth international Rendan Heyi model forum hosted by the Higher Group in Qiandao. I thank Higher Group Chairman Zhang Rui Min for inviting me to give my views on innovation to this distinguished gathering. I would add that I greatly appreciate the support he has expressed for some of the ideas in my work on innovation in the past decade. A word about my professional background. I have made my career as an economic theorist, working mainly in macroeconomics. First, unemployment, and later, income tax design to pull up wages of the poor in the first half of my career, from the 1960s to the 1990s. Then, the rewards of work, beginning in 1997, and the roots of innovation, beginning in 2004. All these studies were departures from neoclassical economics. Neoclassical theory viewed all work as tiresome or burdensome, a cause of disutility, as Stanley Jevons put it. And it viewed innovations as the obvious applications of discoveries made by scientists and explorers around the world, as Arthur Spiethoff and Joseph Schumpeter uh, supposed. I would like to expound the theory of innovation I have developed. Then I will discuss the developments in the higher group. In my book, Mass Flourishing, I argue that one of the serious mistakes of neoclassical theory was that it overlooked some human desires and abilities. For one thing, that theory did not recognize that people have an innate desire and ability to create, to imagine and conceive products or methods. That desire and ability can be traced as far back as the prehistoric Homo sapiens who conceived and managed to create a usable flute. It was found in a South German cave and the Neanderthals before them, who evidently took pleasure in drawing figures on the wall of the caves they lived in. So creativity was displayed even in prehistoric times. It is not surprising then, owing to this innate desire, that the creation and adoption of new methods of production and new products what we now, now call an innovation, ultimately became familiar in the national economy. By the middle of the 19th century, mostly in the West, many people in the economy were sometimes, perhaps often, engaged in conceiving and creating something new. It was the widespread exercise of people's creativity within the economy that fueled much, perhaps most, of the widespread innovation arising in the West. Importantly, a great many of the creative advances were the ideas of ordinary people, to use a term appearing in mass flourishing. The jobs that people had in farms, fisheries, factories, offices, and other places helped point them toward new and better methods, and in some cases, new products. In some fortunate nations, in which there had been a classical economy of producing and trading, an innovation economy arose. At its core, I wrote in my book, Dynamism, was a vast imaginarium a space for conceiving, creating, marketing, and perhaps even adopting the new. This innovative activity brought two kinds of rewards, material and non-material. 
The material rewards came from the rise of economic growth in the lead nations in Britain, later America, and soon after Germany and France. A comparative statistical study of total factor productivity growth rates across some 15 Western nations over almost a century, conducted in my recent book, Dynamism, found that most of the economic growth in the lead nations of the West from the late 1800s to the mid 1900s can be attributed to this indigenous innovation. I have been ascribing not to the discoveries exogenous to the business sector and its employees inside the economy, the high growth rates of total factor productivity not only made many people rich in their businesses, it also pulled low-skilled low workers out of poverty. And middle-class people working in the economy were prospering. They saw their incomes rising enormously over their careers. Of course, employees contributing to innovations may have received bonuses and promotions. The non-material rewards were also hugely important for a great many people. Lives of imagining and creating were meaningful lives. They gave meaning to work beyond the paychecks. These profound rewards enjoyed by many people engaged in such work brought an extraordinary sense of flourishing, being a part of something, meeting challenges, expressing oneself, and personal growth. These non-material rewards became, for many people, just as important as the material rewards of work, maybe more important for some people. It should not be surprising that a relatively high rate of innovation in a country is a relatively reliable predictor of high life satisfaction, according to analyses by responses to household surveys. I would comment that although work is not important to the culture of many countries, work was, and perhaps still is to a degree, central to a meaningful life in America as described in several Hollywood films. My book, Dynamism, comments that uh, a dream held by, that the American dream, a dream held by many Americans, is best interpreted as a hope of succeeding at something in one's life. In contrast, the neoclassical theory developed by Joseph Schumpeter in the 1910s and extended by Robert Solo in the 1950s, saw only the innovations that were mere commercial applications of the discoveries by scientists and explorers around the world. It completely overlooked the indigenous innovation springing from new ideas bubbling up inside the nation's economy and bringing innovations for decades in much of the West. Neoclassical theory also overlooked the non-material rewards to people engaged in innovating. Also the employees participating in a company developing an innovation. Yet there was more research to be done. While some of the Western nations, say from 1860 to 1960, demonstrated a high rate of indigenous in innovation some others did not. What could explain the extraordinarily high rates of innovation in some nations and not others? It is interesting and may be important to identify the source of the comparatively high rates of innovation found in some nations. A brief examination of this question in my book, Mass Flourishing, showed that of 18 countries with advanced economies, the five estimated to possess the highest degree of modernism, Switzerland, Denmark, Austria, Iceland, and the United States, are among the most innovative. Deeper studies are reported in my book, Dynamism. 
Chapter five there finds that several values contribute to indigenous innovation, such as the, the trust, willingness to take initiative, the desire to achieve on the job, teaching children to be independent, and the acceptance of competition. Chapter six shows a positive statistical relationship between an index of modernism and a measure of indigenous innovation. I will now turn to some of the extraordinary developments in the higher group over the past several years and some questions for discussion uh, that I have. It was a joy to find the affinity between the perspective that I developed in Mass Flourishing and the perspective behind Hire's reinvention of its management model leading to the Rendan Hayi model. I know I don't pronounce it very well. We are united in recognizing that to acquire enough dynamism to achieve indigenous innovation on a wide scale, a nation must draw on the creativity of ordinary people, not just advantaged and gifted people. The breakthrough here is Hire's Rundanheyi model. This model drives employees to innovate around users' needs. In this model, any employee can compete to join a project with a competitive proposal, and employees are no longer passively executing orders, but rather actively, they are active entrepreneurs and, and partners with decision-making powers. Hire's model uh, drives employees to innovate around users' needs, thus to ensure sustainable upward growth momentum at Hire. Under the Rendanheyi model, everyone can become his own CEO. First of all, I want to say that the development and the spread of the Rendanheyi model of, of management, first proposed by Chairman Zhang Rui, Rui Min, is in my opinion highly important. An important step forward from my perspective is the policy to draw when needed on the creativity and inside information of one or more employees to solve a problem faced by the company rather than to hire one or more outsiders, outside experts. That policy will often be better for the co company than hiring outside experts. Using the employees to solve the problem may have the further benefit that it raises their morale and the morale of much of the company's workforce. While in contrast, hiring outsiders does not. It may undermine morale. If companies in the Chinese economy, in the private sector at least, normally looked to uh, their employees to solve their problems, that would raise morale, morale over much of the country's labor force. It would be uplifting, as my friend, the Finnish philosopher S.S. S. Saarinen, uh, would say. Innovation would increase all or most companies in the economy. This advance in management of companies in the higher group differs from what I believe to be the development in companies that was so strong in America. In my conception of what developed there in America, an employee of the company, and of course the head of a company, might occasionally conceive a better way of making something or a better thing to make. What emerged in the West was the rise of a continuing supply, a rate of supply per month or per year, or per year of new ideas coming from the employees, company leaders, and even a few people arriving in the economy. In contrast, what has developed in the higher group, in my understanding, is the occasional demand for new ideas 
from within the companies rather than from outside experts. This managerial development by Chairman Zhang and colleagues is a rightward movement, uh, rightward movement up the innovative supp innovation supply curve, which is pulling up innovation achieved in companies. The development in America that I describe in Mass Flourishing was a rightward, rightward shift of the supply curve of innovation. The new ideas were not necessarily and perhaps not generally a response to address a problem. Of course, each of these developments can be expected to lift the rate of innovation. Of course, I am not an insider with a deep and detailed understanding of how this new management model is performing. It is quite clear that, as is commented in the letter I have read, the Ren, Rendan Heyi model is conceived and it has been operating to address the management dilemma of large organizations, crack the management conundrum of the internet era, and develop a management model unique to the Internet of Things era. Yet it seems clear that this management technique could be extended to, other, to some other industries with some expectations of success. I would suppose that some of the high officials of the higher group have already given some thought to such extensions of the Rendan Heyi model to other industries or sectors of the economies in which higher operates. One other comment, higher presents the Rendan Heyi model as driving its employees to innovate around users' needs. I would add that a nation needs, in addition, people in the economy who have the imagination and the talent to create demands that never existed before and were never imagined before. That is a big part of innovation in human history, I believe. I want to add that I feel privileged to have been welcomed for many years by the Chinese people. It has been a heartwarming experience to have witnessed the extraordinary achievements in that time. I have come to have the greatest admiration for the people of China. Thank you very much.